Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We have an update with Telescope Resources. Telescope recently did a webinar with us. I think it was about two or three months ago where they ran through the full company. So if you're new to the Telescope, I would recommend that you check that out. They also did a webinar last week with Paul Benwell's group. So you, you can check that out. This webinar will really focus on recent news items. As always, this will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to know more about that, you can find them on the company's disclosures on their website. And there will be a Q&A section, so feel free to input Q&A at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Matt Philgate, VP Corp Dev, and Terry Harbort, CEO of Talisker. Hi, Matt. Hi, hey, Terry. Deb. How are you doing today? Excellent. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us and providing an update. I believe you put out a material release last week that we're going to run through. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Deborah. Uh, welcome, everybody. Just like to take a bit of time, run through the press release. It was quite a significant one for us. Just giving everybody an outline on the progress that we've made towards the resource, coming in very close to that resource now. Um, so Matt has done a great job getting together a series of long sections that show the intercepts of each of the veins that's coming into resource. We've picked out the top 11 uh, that are the closest we have modelled now. There may be more that we add to that coming into resource, but these are the ones that we've got the most holes in. So we'll have a quick look at that and then uh, throw it open to, to questions uh, to, to anybody on the call. Sounds good. A little bit of an update where we are. Uh, we've, we've actually reduced the number of rigs that we've had, so we've been going pretty hard with eight or nine rigs over the last few months. Uh, as we're coming into finalising this resource, uh, we've reduced it right back first to six rigs in April and then now down to three rigs. Um, we're doing an iterative process on the vein resources. So what that means is uh, we're actually calculating the resource um, or the potential resource and then determining where we want to put the remaining metres of our holes. Um, so it's a very effective way and very efficient way to use our final drill metres uh, very well in defining this resource. Uh, since acquiring Braylon, we've completed uh, a bit over uh, uh, 140,000 metres of drilling, uh, so quite a bit of drilling since we're coming in. Uh, the team's also done a great job in validating uh, some of the historic drilling. There's about 400,000 metres of historic drilling much of this is very old, so we can't use it. Uh, there's no quality control certificates. Location's not great. Um, however, certainly from uh, the 2000s onward, there's historic data that we can uh, locate very well and we can uh, acquire the quality control certificates from the laboratories. So we've got about uh, 112,000 metres of this historic drill data that we can use. So. All in all, that, that's uh, given us to date about 100 and, uh, 250,000 metres of drilling that we can use to define the veins. Um, our 43101 uh, uh, resource statement document is well underway. Uh, we've had a external QP who's already come to site for several days. We'll be utilising Innovo Explo out of Valdor very experienced with um, vein resource estimation and a very reputable group. Um, of the results that we've uh, released last week uh, and the summary that we put out, the weighted average grades that we see for the veins for each individual veins ranges from about 6.2 grams per tonne to 16.6 .6 grams per tonne. Uh, and the average that we see across this is about 9.6 uh, grams per tonne of gold. Now, uh, this might change coming into our resource. We've still got drilling to do. Um, it certainly is in, on the high end of our estimate. Uh, we originally estimated somewhere between uh, seven to nine grams. So we're quite encouraged by this uh, increase in grade. Um, just for the shareholders, be forewarned, this may change. It may go up, it may go down. We don't know yet. It's based on the averages and we still need to run the geostatistics on the models. What we're also encouraged with is the average vein widths that we're seeing here. We're seeing averages from 1.1 metre up to 2.1 metres uh, and we're seeing a rough average of about 1.6 metres. Uh, we know uh, depending on the drill angle of how we've drilled down into the veins, uh, that this is 80 to 90% of the true thickness. So we're actually seeing an increase in the 
uh, true thickness of the veins uh, comparable to the historic average, which was about 90 centimetres, 0.9 of a metre. Uh, so we're seeing an increase there. And the main reason for that is that we're drilling a lot of new veins in areas that, that weren't previously uh, stoked or mined. Uh, and, of course, all the defined veins that we've uh, drilled so far that are coming into the resource are located from surface down to a depth of 700 metres. We're well aware that the veins continue further beyond that, but our focus has been on the shallow veins uh, so we can reduce our drill costs to get this uh, maiden resource. Uh, here's a breakdown of each of the veins, uh, 11 veins here. In the uh, table here, the, the um, first numeric column we have is uh, how many pierce points that have intercepted that are greater than three grams per tonne. Again, just be warned that three grams per tonne isn't an economic cutoff. This is just an average uh, cutoff that we expect at some stage to be an economic cutoff. As we're drilling inferred, category where we're not applying economics, uh, but we still want to build this resource on something that we're fairly certain will be economic down the road. Uh, the next column there is the remaining pierce points. Uh, this has changed uh, slightly, of course, since we put the press release out because we're still drilling right now. Uh, but as you'll see, we've completed the lion's share of pierce points coming into the veins. Uh, then we've got the dimensions of the vein, uh, the vein uh, strike length, and um, uh, vein plunge length. You'll see that there are significant uh, meterages here. Uh, we're looking around about an average of four to 500 meters to find a long strike and a similar average uh, for the veins uh, 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 along the plunge. So very good panels, economic panels of um, vein that have been developed. And this combines well, of course, with the final column, the average vein width. Uh, the intercept width, and we expect that the uh, final width is to be 80 to 90% of that true width. Um, one comment that we've got there down the bottom is that it, it's a diluted width. Now, what that means is, is um, our minimum sample interval that we take is uh, 50 centimetres. Um, so the minimum uh, material that we'll bring into the average vein width is uh, 1.5 metres. So we take uh, extra material simply because the minimum sample which we have is of that minimum 50 centimetre unit. Uh, the other one there is the average grade. Uh, you'll see natural variation in there. Uh, the lowest one we see down at the Alhambra vein, 6.2. Uh, then we see a few around nine grams per tonne and then some higher ones right up there to 15 and 16 grams per tonne. Uh, so that's no real surprise to us um, having these strong grades. We expect this from the historic Braylon uh, that had very consistent, very good grades. So some large veins there, you'll notice the 77 vein, nearly 700 metres along strike length. Uh, we'll have a look at that in section. It's been divined fairly close to surface, so just the 400 metres depth. So a lot of upside there remaining in that vein. Uh, some of the best veins here are the 55 hanging wall and the 55 vein. The hanging wall in particular defined quite a large panel there, over 500 metres, nearly 600 metres by 750 metres. Um, and the grade coming back very well in that vein at uh, 15.2 grams per tonne uh, weighted average. So in general, th things are looking very good. We've got no surprises here. Um, the veins are developing very well along strike uh, and good, good uh, grades. Let's have a look at where some of these veins sit. We see our, our traditional breakup of the blocks of the veins. Uh, the majority you'll see are in the Braylon West area. Braylon East and down here at Pioneer. Uh, the Alhambra and the BK, uh, BK vein sit in the gap zone, the historic ownership zones between the King and the Braylon mine. The 101, uh, 55 hanging wall, 55 and 53 are extensions of veins that were historically mined in Braylon. And the 51B foot wall and the majority of the 77 that we've drilled uh, new areas, so these sit in the historic gaps between the Braylon and the Pioneer mines. And then finally, the main 
hanging wall vein, the main vein and the J vein are predominantly in the pioneer area. So what you note here uh, from the previous table, some of this great strike length, each of the ticks you'll see down the bottom here are a kilometre long. So you see some of these veins have got great strike length uh, of a kilometre to two kilometres. So one of the things that Braylorn's very well known for is this great structural continuity. Right, let's have a look at uh, some of the veins. So how do I understand these long sections? I'm sure some of our shareholders are, are well aware of how these long sections work. Uh, we've got the surface topography up the top here, this thin line. Um, if you see a white area below that, that's what we call overburden. So that's, uh, in this case, generally unconsolidated material or, or faulted over material that doesn't contain vein. In this case, for the 55, our vein target panel goes all the way to surface. And that's the blue. The blue is our area where we determine there will be vein material. So that's what we're trying to drill out. Uh, you'll see in the blue area, we've got the green dots here with a cross in them. Uh, these are pierce points that uh, are yet to be drilled or they're pierce points that we uh, have drilled and we're waiting for results to come back from the laboratory. The golden area that you can see with the dashed line, that's the area that we've drilled out that's above that arbitrary three gram per ton. Um, so that may change, it may go up or down, but it's a good indication a lot of the mines of this type around the world use that rule of thumb as a three gram cutoff. And then the light blue areas, they're generally areas that would be below uh, that cutoff area. So uh, we do have high grade areas and we do have low grade areas in the vein. Uh, that's a very common thing in uh, natural vein system, this grade variability. Uh, so we anticipate that those light blue areas probably wouldn't be mined, they'd probably be waste material. And these golden areas would be material that uh, would go to the mill. In each of the bubbles that we see, we've got uh, grams, grams per metre, uh, and then the drill hole name defined there. And on our website, we've got a full list of uh, what the composites were that were used to generate these. So if anybody wants to go into great detail, you're welcome to, to go back and have a look at what those original drill results were uh, for each of these holes. We've also taken the liberty to uh, do a gram metre calculation uh, and show that as a colour-coded system. So we've put in here anything below that three gram is blue, uh, three to six grams is yellow, and uh, red is six to 10 gram meters, and purple is greater than 10 grand, uh, gram meters. So the purple's very good, uh, the red's good, and the uh, yellow is, uh, is mineable. Uh, so that's how we classify each one of these. Uh, so I, I, I won't go through each of these in great detail. Uh, if um, any of our viewers would like to have a look at a specific one and ask specific questions, we're happy to go to it. So I'll move through these fairly quickly. Um, here's the main vein long section. Uh, you'll see here there's a white section here above it that's uh, overburden. Um, still, uh, it's one of the final ones to drill down there at Pioneer, so we still have quite a few pierce points that are remaining to come in. But again, a lot of purple, uh, very strong grand meter intercepts in these areas. Uh, the 15.5 hanging wall vein, uh, again, some great results. This is the one that averages 16 grams per ton in total. Um, so well-defined areas, a lot of purple here again. Um, most of the drilling we've got is fairly close to surface on the 55 hanging wall vein. Uh, so we should complete that drilling uh, very quickly over the next uh, month or so. Uh, the 101 vein, uh, not the best looking vein in our sequence. Uh, it's parallel to the 55 and the 55 hanging wall vein and the 53. So we're drilling down through this vein uh, as we target the other veins. It doesn't look as sexy as some of the other veins. We've got some significant areas of low grade material but still some good panels of vein here. We're looking at uh, nearly 500 metres by 400 metres in a panel. 
So although it might look that good, these are actually very good intercepts that we see. Uh, we'll target some more closer to surface material coming in here. Uh, the J vein down at Pioneer, uh, with the main vein still a bit more drilling to do to fill in these areas, uh, relatively close to surface again, developing into quite a, a good vein down to 700 metres. Uh, the 53 vein, uh, a nice strong um, panel of vein developed here. Most of the drilling we have to complete is within a couple of hundred metres of surface where these green, uh, green dots are. Again, a lot of purple here, a lot of plus 10 gram metre material, so uh, very good looking vein intercepts. Uh, the Alhambra, not too many new holes in the Alhambra, uh, Alhambra sorry, vein. Um, many of these are uh, historic drill holes from the 2014-2015 uh, Avino era, uh, but still building some good vein material there. At the moment, we don't have any planned holes uh, for this area. The BK vein, um, this is one that was the last one to be mined, uh, that if any of you have come to site, you would have gone underground and see the BK vein. Again, we know that it comes almost all the way to surface. A lot of purple gram meter hits here, so a lot of very good material. Uh, we've got a few holes planned there just to extend uh, some of these very good looking ore shoots um, underground. You would have seen uh, several, uh, about 100 metres of ore shoot width, uh, and we're certainly seeing that here, about 100 metres to 200 metres of good uh, intercepts. Uh, the 51 below footwall or BFW vein uh, developed quite well. We haven't drilled much of this uh, at depth. It sits down below uh, many of the other veins, uh, so most of our peer points have, have come in uh, relatively high. Uh, again, some good purple and red uh, defining this vein. The main hanging wall vein, so this sits below the main vein, similar to the main vein, a lot of more drilling close to surface down to about 500 metres that's planned uh, over the next few weeks uh, and this is currently underway for this vein. Uh, and now the 55, uh, sorry, the 77 vein, um, this is a sister vein to the 77B that was mined very deep. Uh, you'll see here we've got almost a two kilometres of target volume here, and this sits between the Bray Lawn and the Pioneer, um, Pioneer Mines. So a lot of new material coming into the resource here. Uh, we've still got final holes here. You see most of these are less than four or 500 metres from surface, so we'll finish those holes very quickly and that'll build out uh, that vein very well. Okay, Deborah, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Uh, I'm sure we've got a few, few questions there um, and I'm happy to answer either on these veins or uh, anything else related to the, the company that uh, our listeners may have. For sure. Um, I've got some questions, so I'll kick things off, but uh, anyone that's participating, feel free to, to put some in the Q&A box. Uh, the first question I have, Terry, is uh, when is the maiden resource due out? What's the updated anticipated timeline? I don't think you mentioned it. Uh, so we're, uh, we're still aiming for around the end of Q2. It all depends on the assay return of the drilling that we're doing. The um, assay turnaround is pretty good at the moment. It's about 28 days to get those final results back. So we can uh, pretty well calculate when, whenever we stop drilling, it's another 28 days to get those uh, results and then about a week, uh, sometimes two weeks to model those into the veins and then about three days to recalculate the resource. We are very advanced on the resource. We uh, have an iterative uh, resource calculation. So every time we get new results, uh, we rewire frame or rebuild the volumes and we run the numbers so we know approximately what our resource looks like with the drilling that we have done. So it's a relatively quick process and gives us a very good guide to where our resource sits and, and whether we're, we're on target. So it's, it's a relatively quick process. So that's what we're aiming for now. Uh, we're hoping no issues. Uh, certainly the expiration has slowed down a bit uh, in Canada 
compared to last year. So we expect those assay timelines to be quite tight. And then it's approximately a 45-day timeline that you have to submit the document, the actual 43101. We're working very hard on the 43101 now. As I mentioned, we've engaged our external QPs. We've done the site visit. We're preparing all of the written material that goes with that so we can just insert the resource into that document and then um, submit that to the regulators. So we're basically bringing everything forward so we can get that out as quickly as possible. So we have that 45-day window, but I'd prefer to bring the resource out as, as, as soon as we possibly can. Okay. And I have an audience question, which is, um, do you have enough cash to get you to the maiden resource estimate? Our, our understanding of where we are now is that uh, we do. We do have enough cash to make it. We're looking at that always and being quite conservative with our cash. That's why we've reduced uh, back to three rigs so we can maintain a good cash position uh, coming into that resource. Um, we're updating our resource all the time and once we've hit our resource targets, then we'll be shutting those rigs down, waiting for the assays, remodelling and put it out. So at the moment I can say, yes, we're, we're on track, assuming we don't have any, any strange things that occur over the next uh, month or so. Great. And uh, so I've got some questions on the geology. So one of the things that seems to make Braylorn stand out is the exceptional vein continuity. Can you talk about the drill spacing you're using to define the infill, inferred resource and the closer drill spacing that would be required to upgrade material to measured indicated categories? Sure. Good. <laughs> good question. Um, Braylorn, of course, well known for it, both its structural continuity. So that's continuity of the host structures uh, and the vertical or down plunge continuity of the grade. Um, at, the, uh, at the current moment, we're drilling at uh, 50 metre spacing for narrow vein or high grade material along strike uh, and about 75 metres down plunge. Uh, so we expect when we go to uh, defining indicated that we're at uh, a half of that, so looking at about uh, 25 metres uh, along strike and somewhere in the realm of uh, 35 uh, or 37 and a half metres down plunge. Thank you. And at Braylorn, you have a very large library of drift assays available. Can you elaborate on whether these are historic or collected recently and how you're using this information in drill targeting for resource estimation? Sure. We, we have about 45,000 historic uh, drift assays, and these are, are both... Uh, assays uh, that were taken in the Stokes and also in expiration, uh, expiration drifts looking for new or additional veins. Unfortunately, only a small percentage of those are compliant. So they, compliancy defines that they're well located, that they have uh, external laboratory assay certificates, uh, and it's only a, a small percentage of these, uh, really several thousand, that we can use towards a resource update. However, the other 40-something uh, thousand is very valuable to us because it allows us to build uh, target models. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why our drilling has been so successful to date. Uh, you know, we've, we've got a very, very strong um, ounce per metre drill record simply because we can locate these veins very well. So as part of our targeting process, we, we model these historic drifts into target volumes, and that gives us a very good estimate of what we expect the final resource uh, to be when we go and drill it. Um, so it's been very valuable for us from a targeting perspective. It means we haven't gone through a, a difficult process of drilling and hoping that we hit veins or trying to target them. Uh, it means we, we know where the veins are. We know pretty well where the, uh, what the thickness is, what the grades are. Uh, we have a lot of historic mapping as well that gives us good structural control on these historic drifts so we can project up from where the known data is and be able to drill these veins very accurately. So while you can't use the data directly in the study, it's really helped you with targeting and bringing down cost of drilling? Yes, yes, that's correct. Only a, only a small bit has that quality control, uh, but it means we can uh, define these target panels um, when we looked at our our sections here. So these blue areas that everyone can see 
their target panels and the targeting of these panels is defined by these historic drift assays. So we know them very well based on these historic drift assays where we expect the veins to be. Makes sense. And how much of the expected resource would be remnant veins near workings and how much is new vein material away from the old stoping? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so we, we've got we've had three types of target modelling, if you like, and and each of these showed in uh, uh, an increase in risk or a, a decrease in in confidence as we started drilling. So many of the early drilling that we did were what we call a remnant vein material. So that's material that that sits in between um, where things were historically mined. And our current resource coming up, we've got around about 10% of our total resource that'll be those panels. And they're quite large panels. They're, they're several hundred metres by several hundred metres um, sitting close to stopes. Then we've got what are called extensions. And these are veins that are extensions along strike from historic uh, stopes. So in general, we put a, a buffer zone around the historic stopes and then we drill away from that. So that's around about 20% of, uh, of our resource coming up. The vast majority, 70%, is completely away from existing working. So this is generally in the historic gap zones between the historic mines where there was little to no development. So the vast majority of it sits right away from old working. So th there are some <laughs> benefits in having one and, and, and not having the other. Access is an easy thing to, to be able to use existing development to be able to get down to where historic mine stopes were. But then you have an increase in uh, issues with health and safety risk, with rock stability uh, and, and, and with location. On the other side, where you have completely new areas where the majority of it is and you don't have any development, then you've got to do the development. Luckily, in our case, and the majority of these veins are within 700 metres from surface, many of these go right up to surface and we'll see here in our first page an example of one of these veins that actually comes right to surface. So this is in the gap zone between Braylon and Pioneer. Uh, it's about a metre thick vein that comes all the way up to surface. So uh, that's one of the benefits of having those areas there. Uh, also much easier for us to drill uh, and we can define a lot of this material very close to surface. So uh, that's why we're happy that we've got the vast majority, about 70% uh, of our material that's um, un untouched previously. Okay. And from the May 2nd press release, it looks like the veins expected to be included in the maiden resource are in gaps between the historic mines. Can you tell us a little bit about which expected resource veins were major, major contributors to past production? Sure. Let's uh, pull some of them up. Um, unfortunately, the, the largest one relative to past production was the uh, 77B vein, uh, which sits in this area here, if you can see my mouse. Um, it was one defined stoke that um, probably about half of the production of Braylon uh, came out of. There, there was some historic production in this area on the 55 and 55 hanging wall veins and on the 53 vein. In Pioneer, um, to the south, there was uh, production on the main and, and the J veins and a small amount of production on the, the main hanging wall vein. Um, during the Aveno era, uh, most of the production was in the gap between the King, uh, which sits up here, and the Braylon mines, which sits down here. Um, most of their production was on the Alhambra and on the BK zone, but it was a relatively small amount of production. Okay. I see some um, audience questions coming in, so I think I'm going to scatter them in there. Um, can you give us a quick overview of your spring summer plans outside of Braylorn? Sure. Um, we, we haven't planned a great deal of work um, outside of Braylorn this year. Um, we wanted to focus our available capital uh, and our, our people onto getting this first resource out for Braylorn. Um, as all of our shareholders would know, it's a fairly tough time in the market at the moment. Um, despite the high gold prices, 
there's been a fair detachment of of value in the junior market space. So we're very uh, conscious of that. So we're being very conservative with our cash and only doing the work that we really need to do. Uh, that said, we, we, we still do have a, a greenfields component. Uh, we still do have some assessment work that, that we need to do in our greenfields. The majority of work that we're looking at doing is continuation of the soil program at the Ladner uh, Gold Project. We want to uh, prepare uh, as many drill targets there at Ladner as we can uh, and extend the known areas of mineralisation across that 28-kilometre strike length. Um, we also have uh, a good mapping program there, so quite inexpensive work programs that we're looking at um, to fully understand the structural controls at Ladna. Uh, we think we've got a very good, well-defined model uh, of the mineralisation there. So we want to get that well under control prior to doing any drilling. We do have some stream sediment follow-up. Uh, this is from work that was done last year. This is work that was completed uh, close to the Nova and Cyclone areas on a previous uh, government mining reserve that was relinquished and we were able to stake uh, immediately. Throughout that stream sediment program, we came across good outcropping epithermal veins and we've got some quite good anomalies uh, from our stream sediment work. So we'd like to allocate a bit of our Greenfields geologist time to going and following up on those and see if we can do some mapping to identify the location of those. Uh, at present, there's no plans to do additional drilling at Golden Hornet. Um, there was a limited market response to our great discovery there due to market conditions. Um, so we don't see any point in really advancing that at a great stage. Uh, and we are in the, the permit process for Nova and Cyclone. Depending on the second half of the year, we'll make a decision on whether we drill that. We hope to have the permit there within the next three months. Uh, if not, we'll push that work program into 2023. Okay, and can you provide a permitting update on Braylorn as well? Sure. So uh, earlier on in the year, we uh, announced that we'd be uh, starting the process to increase the uh, daily tonnage uh, process at uh, Braylon from the current 100 tonne per day up to 1,500 tonne per day. We expect the total timeline of that will be uh, anywhere between a year to 18 months. It's a relatively straightforward process. We need to update the mine plan from the uh, historic or, or in-place mine plan uh, to deal with a larger plan. We won't be changing the mining method. We'll still be continuing uh, long hole stoping there. Once we've completed the resource, we'll be able to define what that mine plan would be. It may not be in the ex existing decline in the BK zone. It may be accessing one of the other historic declines, such as the Empire area that sits in the gap between Braylawn and, and Pioneer. At present, we're looking at a, a toll milling process, so not actually having a situation where we bring in a mill and uh, a processing plant on site, but actually trucking over to uh, New Afton or another toll milling facility. We're in the process of conducting all characterization through the New Afton circuit at present. So we can see if uh, that works well. We see at this point no reason why it shouldn't. So that will then fit into the material that we submit to the government on that increase in the permit size. Thank you. And I had one question for you that's mining related. So from the May 2nd press release, you mentioned that the maiden resource will include material between surface and 700 meters depth. Can you talk about the expected mining strategy, underground versus open pit, and anticipated split between the two, if any? At the moment, what we're looking at is most likely 100% underground. And the underground components will be divided into narrow vein, uh, long hole, and, and probably larger stoke long haul. So our viewers will be aware that we've had a significant amount of bulk tonnage style mineralization. Uh, we've been able to identify that this bulk tonnage is associated with breccia zones that are focused around the high grade veins. So we're, we're running models now to look at if we apply a larger stoke width, such as three, five or seven meter stoke width, 
what are the economics of these larger bulk areas? So we're, we're most advanced on the narrow veins and the majority of perhaps all the majority of our resource at this stage will be based on those um, on the narrow veins that we've presented here today. Uh, however, we're hopeful that we can add a significant amount that's related to a more bulk style of mineralization using a larger stoke width. Uh, at this stage, we don't see much potential for open pit, uh, but we are still looking at those scenarios. Uh, it's much more complicated from a permitting sense. Uh, we would have to change the mining method and, and re-permit this area, and then that, that, that would take a, a, an amount of time to do. Whereas uh, the underground scenario, particularly the bulk scenario, allows us to get that increase in volume without having to deal with a, a lot more tailings and a lot more waste rock on surface. You'd be able to have a mining scenario where you could backfill that, paste backfill into the stopes that you've mined and also utilise the historic stopes to be able to store waste material. So uh, I think that, that's an excellent option and really gives the whole project uh, some pretty good optionality with those couple of mining methods and blending scenarios. We do have our eyes open though for possibility for open pit and for also for larger scale bulk tonnage, whether that be uh, a block cave scenario or a sub-level cave. We're well aware down at Pioneer that we had some uh, large 100 gram meter intercepts over, over more than 100 meters. So we are still in the early stages of evaluating that and it's part of Braylon's bigger scale upside. What we know and love is that the high grade veins are very good and they're going to work. But what we're taking time to do is prepare these other models and look at other mining scenarios that could add to the total ounce budget that could come out of this project. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about ore sorting possibilities for Braylorn like pre-concentration options. I think you mentioned it in the past, if it's a possibility. And if so, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of new technologies in the mining space. Um, all sorting, for those who aren't aware, it is generally broken down into a, a density-based all sorting that uses X-ray technology, uh, and then an, an optical sorter that, that uses visible light spectrum to be able to select ore and differentiate ore from waste or high grade from low grade. Uh, with Braylon, there's a very strong contrast, uh, both in the, the color of the ore versus the waste. The veins are white. Uh, in general, we've got fairly dark host rocks, uh, either the, the diorite or the, the basalts. And we also have <laughs> very colored alteration material that sits in the boundaries. We know that the majority of our ore is related to uh, sulfide crack and seal bands. So there's a distinct density contrast there as well uh, from the waste and ore. So we haven't set any material down for processing. Um, we've been discussing with our board member, Eric Tromblay, who's COO at uh, the Curragnalt deposit uh, owned by Dalridian, uh, a very similar style of deposit, very similar veins, a uh, phanerozoic orogenic system as well, very similar to Braylon. Uh, so we have the expectation that the outcome of their ore sorting studies will be very similar to what we can expect for Braylon. What's most important is that we don't need ore sorting at Braylon, that it looks like the grade is at high enough level, um, that the project will be economic uh, without ore sorting, but ore sorting can certainly assist to add that, um, add to those economics and also reduce the transporting costs. If in production, uh, we were to utilize a, a toll milling process, uh, it can, if we've got a 30% mass fall, it can greatly reduce the amount of volume that we need to put in trucks and transport offsite. Okay, thanks. And thanks for covering what that was. I didn't know what it was until Magda pointed it out recently. I have one audience question, which is what is the average SG of vein material? I am assuming specific gravity. Yes, yeah, so the average uh, specific gravity to be to be exact is uh, uh, two point six seven on the veins is two point six seven. Okay. Then I switching gears, I had some questions uh, related to your corporate strategy. You mentioned Golden Hornet is something that you're not going to pursue in the near term. Um, would you consider an option agreement 
JV partnership on that asset or any of your other uh, secondary properties? Well, uh, all depends really on, on market conditions and access to capital. Certainly access to capital this year is, has, has dried up a fair bit. Uh, and we don't know how long that's going to continue for. Our projects at the moment are, uh, have, have got uh, very good assessment levels. So this is monies that we need to spend to keep the ground in, in, in good standing. So, for example, Golden Hornet is uh, secure for a, another couple of years. If we get to the point where um, we need to uh, apply assessment work and we're focused on our primary assets, then, of course, that is an option to have a look at an earning uh, or a joint venture style of agreement on those non-core assets. Really, what we'd prefer to do, though, is, is retain those in the portfolio, uh, advance our flagship projects to a stage where we can uh, sell those assets or sell the company and then spin out the remaining assets and go straight to a resource footing once again. So really our strategy is to be able to develop and sell as many of these excellent projects as we can and we try to develop them or, or take them higher in the pipeline uh, each year as we go so we have another project sitting ready. So at the current stage, Braylon's at the top, uh, Ladner's ready for resource drilling and um, Golden Hornet is at discovery stage. So the next step is to take that to footprint stage if we're delayed in uh, building up and selling our primary assets, then certainly that, that's an option that we'd look at if it was in the best interest of our shareholders and our corporate strategy. Okay. And we talked a little bit about Ladner. Um, maybe you can elaborate on the strategy there, where it is relative to Braylorn, what kind of deposit model it has, et cetera, and your plans for this year there. Sure, the Latina project, um, quite similar in a number of aspects to Braylawn. Uh, it sits to the uh, southeast of Braylawn on a very similar uh, tectonic or continental suture zone, so where two uh, large continental blocks have come together. Uh, by road, it's about uh, 150 kilometres or so east of Vancouver uh, on Highway 1 and then the Coca-Cola Highway, so very good access. It's higher level geologically than Braylon, so it's in sedimentary rocks or ocean floor sedimentary rocks, but it still has very deep ultramafic material or very deep ocean floor and upper mantle material. So what we can uh, infer from that is that it's got a very deep conduit down towards uh, deeper zones in the earth where gold can be transported by volatiles up to the surface. Um, so again, we see these ultramafics or serpentinized ultramafic rocks that are from very deep areas, very similar to Braylon. What, what's quite different at Ladner is the structural architecture that we see. So we see a lot of folded material here um, and the controls of the mineralization is uh, what we call a saddle reef style of deposit. Um, anyone who's worked in uh, Atlantic Canada would know the Maguma terrain or those of you who have been following uh, Kirkland Lake Gold and the Forsterville uh, deposit, that's a saddle reef style of deposit. So it's related to folding within the sedimentary rocks and migration of ore bearing fluids up the fold hinges of these rocks. So we get uh, tend to get long linear shoots of gold mineralization. We also see at Ladner that there's a, a uh, carbonate component. So uh, that's a replacement style of deposit where material comes and deposits a lot of sulfide material. So you tend to get, uh, in addition to the veins, the quartz veins, you tend to get areas of semi-massive to massive sulphide material. And some of the small-scale mining at Ladner were very large stopes, 50 metre by 50 metre stopes of semi-massive sulphide material. So realistically, it's quite easy to explore for these areas because they have a quite a large footprint and they have a very good signature in the soil profile, which luckily at Ladner is very well developed. There's not a great deal of overburden material from glacial transportation. So what's our plan at Ladna? Well, um, our plan is to strip it right back and do the right work. 
So there's a large land package, uh, 14,000 hectares. It covers about 28 kilometres along this suture zone, along this pipeline down to very deep in the earth. Um, the early stage work has been very focused and not very distributed. So what we want to do is do systematic work, systematic geochemical sampling across the entire belt. We want to do good quality mapping and really understand what the fold architecture is because we believe those two key elements are the most important in being able to define the controls of mineralization and define our drilling. So a lot of the early drilling that we'll be looking at will be expanding the existing resource up and down plunge. But what we want to do is find other areas where we can start drilling where there's been no development. So a long strike and a long plunge that are the same styles of mineralization that we see in the historic Ladner deposit. Okay. And is there access to in infrastructure in that region? So the Ladner project is quite an in, in, incredible uh, project as far as access goes. Uh, the four-lane Coca-Cola Highway so it uh, goes through the southern end. And curiously, the project actually has its own freeway exit. Uh, so very easy access, about an hour and a half drive uh, from Vancouver to get to the project. Um, good network of forestry roads up through the project. Uh, it's got grid, uh, grid electricity right there. It's got a tailings dam that's fully maintained. Uh, there's a small amount of underground access that's fully dewatered at this stage. We can get right in there and do mapping, do sampling. Um, so a lot of excellent infrastructure there. Uh, the mill, historic mill, is still on site. Uh, we'd probably look at, at scrapping that. It would be too expensive to repurpose it. But there is some uh, building infrastructure there as well that we can repurpose and, and use in the early stages of the project. Okay. And when was Ladner mined? How many years did it produce for? Ounces generated, uh, grades mined, etc. cetera? Uh, it was mined in the early 1980s. Very small production, about uh, 44,000 ounces came out. Uh, the average grade was eight grams per tonne. It was during a boom in, in the gold market. So like many projects in the early 80s, went into production very fast and then closed down very fast. So there has been a lot of drilling done through that stage, defining resource and much of the compliant resource that remains is in this area, simply up plunge and down plunge from where they mined. However, they only really produced about a bit over 40,000 ounces. Okay. I think I've uh, questioned you enough about Ladner for today. Um, I, I did have a couple of final questions, one of which is, can you elaborate on your M&A strategy and just your overall strategy. I had a couple of questions related to some of your strategic partners and kind of how you view the accumulation and uh, um, divestation of assets. All right. So our, our M&A strategy relative to uh, people investing in us, that's, uh, yeah, sure. Um, okay. So the main strategic that we have is, is new gold. New gold owns 14.9% uh, of our company. So New Gold are under a standstill uh, at the moment. They've got about uh, 10 or 11 months left on the standstill. So any takeover offer from New Gold at this point needs to be a friendly offer. Um, so they're, they're able to make an offer at any stage. They just have to uh, do, it, do it in a polite way. They are able to accumulate up to 99%, but not beyond that uh, without any notification of us. They have a top-up right to maintain their current position of 14.9. Have we received interest from other parties? Well, the, the simple answer is yes. There's not a lot of resource stage permanent assets in first world jurisdictions or, or in Canada in general. So there is a lot of interest. Whether other companies will come in and will challenge New Gold for it, I guess we'll, we'll see that over the next couple of months before we come into resource. We really have no control as to whether we receive offers or not. Uh, everyone that we've signed uh, confidentiality agreements with and led into our data room does have a standstill. So things things need to be be quite friendly. Although as soon as somebody makes an offer, then all the standstills come off and everyone else can make the offers that they so desire. 
As we're under confidentiality, I can't really elaborate on whether we're expecting to receive offers and when we're expecting to see receive them and what form they're expected to have uh, because we're under CA with, with each of these companies. All as I can say is, yes, that there has been interest and um, I hope everyone uh, keeps their, their eyes peeled to, to, to see some change in, in the strategic presence in Talisker. Okay, great. And then one final question, because I think we're coming up to the hour. Um, so I guess, could you just list the upcoming catalysts and expected timelines for, for the markets? So they know what to expect out of Talisker in the coming months. Well, really, the big uh, catalyst coming in is the uh, is the resource and the 43101 statement. I think we'll all agree from this last press release that it's looking very strong. Grades are looking good. Uh, and people can do their own calculations on where they think the uh, total number of ounces is looking. But we're, our team's quite happy with the progress there. Uh, we have a lot of drill results still to come back from the laboratory. There's some uh, short-term catalysts that are, that are coming out. Uh, and then I guess probably the largest uh, catalyst that, that I hope we can expect to see is some form of a takeover bid coming for the company. When this is going to be, I, I can't really judge at this stage. Uh, my expectation is probably post-resource that once we've de-risked the, the asset to a certain level that we'd see um, companies coming in, they'd have a look and do their own calculations based on what we've done uh, and then look to uh, acquire or, or make an offer to be able to put bait on back into the production that, that we really believe it, it should be in at this stage. Well, it seems like exciting times for Talisker. Is there anything that you wanted to cover in this session that we didn't get a chance to discuss, Terry? Not really, Deborah. Just a reminder to everybody that, that Talisker just isn't Braylon, that we have a superb pipeline of projects and that these projects are being advanced. Uh, Ladna, the most likely here, and something that, uh, given opportunity, the team could take to resource base in a relatively quick time. Similar to what we've done in Braylon, that within two years, we've taken it from zero to resource base. And we'd look to do the same for a, another project, take them rapidly into, uh, into a resource base um, and build these assets up. So we've, we've got a whole series of projects there. Uh, so if the point comes that we do sell Braylon or sell the company for Braylon, there's a lot more to come. And when you're buying shares in Talisker, you're not just doing it for Braylon, even though that might be how we're valued in the market. You're actually doing it for a long-term strategy. I think that makes sense. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today, Terry. Uh, anyone that has any questions that weren't answered, feel free to reach out to myself and I'll make sure they get answered by the company or, or you can reach out to the company directly. And thanks everyone for your time and for joining us today. Thanks, Terry, for answering all my questions. Um, I, I have actually had a question pop up here uh, in the chat window. So if that's okay with you, Deborah, I'll answer Go it. For it. It's uh, regarding surface rights at, uh, at Braylon, or I guess it is, and uh, whether that's a risk factor in being acquired. We own, own the vast majority of surface rights within the Braylon mine permit area. And we, we certainly uh, own the mineral rights for the entire area. Most of these are Crown grants, so the access uh, is inherent in the right of the project. So really, I don't see that as a risk factor in being acquired. If there are any other smaller blocks, then that, that comes down to a, a negotiation part for the acquirer. But at this stage, we've been quite diligent in acquiring as many of these blocks as we can that are in critical positions, such as access to underground portals or flat areas where we can position infrastructure. Makes sense. Well, thanks for answering that final one. And thanks again for your time, Terry. And yeah, as I Very said much. before, if anyone has any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out. And yeah, looking forward to some of these catalysts. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, you too.